And all I have to do now is get my posing routine down more perfect, which is almost impossible to do, you know. It's perfect already. Oh, yeah. It's down to a point. Wait when you see it. <laughs> when thinking of the quintessential Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, it's tempting to throw around titles like Total Recall, the first two Terminator movies, Commando, or Conan the Barbarian. And while the action blockbusters that made him so big definitely have their merit, I think one of his most entertaining films came out before he became the highest paid actor in the world, a 1977 documentary by the name of Pumping Iron. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, before Arnold was a movie star, he was a bodybuilder. And he wasn't just a bodybuilder. He was the number one bodybuilder. And you are the top bodybuilder. Right, yeah. How long have you been the top bodybuilder? Well, I've not been beaten for the last seven years. The documentary follows the three-month build-up towards his sixth attempt to take the trophy for Mr. Olympia, the biggest bodybuilding competition in the world. One of his competitors is Lou Ferrigno who you might recognize as the Incredible Hulk before CG. The primary storyline of the film is the rivalry between these two. In many ways, they are polar opposites. For Arnold Schwarzenegger, winning is a fact of life. He does everything in his power to win, even if it means sacrificing his relationships. And uh, it was in a way a sad story when my father died, because my mother called me on the phone and she said, uh, you know, your dad died, and this was exactly two months before a contest. And I didn't explain to her really the reasons why. You know, I had other excuses to her because how do you explain a mother who, uh, whose uh, husband died, you know, your trip? I didn't bother with it. Our image of Arnold is a cold-hearted, charismatic, extroverted champion, unhindered by doubt, fear, or even empathy. He is dirty blonde, radically honest, and always surrounded by beautiful women or his gym bodybuilder buddies. He works out at Muscle Beach, or in Gold's Gym in California. So it's almost as if his setting is a function of his identity. Lou Ferrigno is his polar opposite. He's never won a Mr. Olympia before, let alone tried to. This is his first attempt at going professional. He is the underdog in almost every way while also juxtaposing almost everything we know about Arnold. Away from the sun, he works out in the confined darkness of his private basement gym. His hair is charcoal black. He is introverted and quiet. His dad, who is also his personal trainer, serves as his mouthpiece and doesn't always paint Lou in an appealing light. Lou was only an infant in the crib and he developed this ear infection. He's surrounded by his family and friends from town. The only constant of the two is their ripped physique as well as their work ethic, shown in a sequence where we cut back and forth between their seemingly endless number of reps. Now, most people watching Pumping Iron don't know too much about the intricacies of judging a bodybuilding competition. The film does give a simplified explanation of the judging process. The judges look for three things, symmetry, proportion, and the size and clarity of each muscle group. But nothing that's enough to tell who is going to win. They're both ripped as hell. In reality, I mean, I see when I watch a Mr. Olympia competition or Mr. Universe competition or any of those things, you know, they all look pretty much the same, the top five guys. But what makes one emerge is, is the way he acts. What we do have is our perception of the personality and mindset of each competitor. So it doesn't come as much of a surprise when Arnold ends up winning. Not just because of his track record, but his willingness to do anything to win, including psychological warfare, or strategic bullying, to break down Lou's self-image and confidence. I mean, they should have it in a month for him, he's not even in shape yet. I mean, gee, he didn't, he didn't get the timing right, I'm telling you. A month from now would have been perfect for you. So I felt that you know, one should use the psychology, one should use everything uh, in as far as food supplements is concerned, uh, you know, use your best, best you know, posing trunks, uh, use, uh, you know, uh, try to use the sun out there and work out in the sun so you get tanned all around, uh, use the best posing routine, just really give me a 10 of everything, then you have a shot of winning. And, uh, and psychology was definitely part of that. But what if I told you that the filmmakers of Pumping Iron just lied to you? 
that the personalities of both Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno were fabricated. Accentuated versions of reality all in the goal of making the documentary more dramatic. A lot of Arnold's stories were made up because he thought it'd make the documentary more interesting. The, the reality is, I made up a lot of this stuff because I felt like that's the way um, you get attention. You have to, uh, I believe that the, the more sensationalistic that you are and the more outrageous things that you say, the more you get quoted, the more you get in the papers, and the more the, the sport of bodybuilding will benefit because the more stories we will get about the sport of bodybuilding. In his book, he admits that his story of being unaffected by his father's death was made up to create the image of an emotionless winner, as well as his awe of dictators to set him up as a villain against Lou. I was always dreaming about very powerful people, dictators and, and things like that. Arnold said outrageous things to both make the film more interesting and showcase his charisma on camera to get the attention of any Hollywood producer who might be seeing the movie. It worked on both fronts. Arnold and his stories and one-liners is, in my opinion, by far the most entertaining part of the film. And a producer named Ed Pressman saw the movie and cast Arnold in his first major starring role. The filmmakers also created an exaggerated version of Lou, who had plans to train at Gold's Gym, but the filmmakers thought it would make a better counterpoint to Arnold if he trained somewhere dark and confined, so his shyness would be a better contrast to Arnold's sunny personality in the open spaces of Muscle Beach. When I saw it for the first time, it made me very angry because I suddenly saw how it portrayed. I was afraid people wouldn't like me. I was afraid people were gonna look down on me. Because the fact that here's a kid from Brooklyn, he's deaf, he can't speak, he looked dumb in the film. What I'm trying to say to you is at the time, I felt like a freak. Even his dad was a character fabricated for the film. This is Lou's real dad, but Lou Ferrigno later admitted that his dad would never have trained him if not for the cameras. What Butler invented was Matty Ferrigno's actual involvement in his son's bodybuilding career. Push it, man! Right. Come on, come on! You see, my father never really uh, was really involved in bodybuilding and they asked him to be in the film. It's then ironic in scenes like this where he's showing Lou how to pose. You look at your arms like you're admiring, right? You're admiring what you're gonna show them. And then you go, boom, like you're saying, take a look at this hunk of man, something like that, okay? Now you might be thinking right now, they made things up, so what? Well, here's where the really interesting part comes in. I think that by filming the documentary, the filmmakers unintentionally altered the results of the competition. Remember that, all of Arnold's fabrications were simply stories he had to make up. Well, Lou actually had to change his training regimen. He was going to train at Gold's Gym in California where he would have gotten more of a tan, which is something that judges look for in a contest. Lou could have also been pushed to train harder if he would have been around other professional bodybuilders. Here I am in New York wearing sweat clothes. I got everybody around me in the gym that are one third of my size, people not looking like bodybuilders. You could see this one scene, I'm walking in and one guy doing a dumbbell kill. Yeah, we got 10 right And it's hard to stay motivated. Now, there's a lot here that I don't know. There's a good chance that even if the filmmakers didn't interfere, Arnold would have still won. But I believe there's a chance that Lou could have. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe their personalities is what made the difference and not the tan. Maybe cameras or no cameras, Arnold would have still convinced Lou that he couldn't win. I don't know much about bodybuilding, so maybe Arnold would have still had the superior physique. Maybe there was no chance for Lou all along. And maybe the filmmakers made the right call making it the way they did. Because Pumping Iron succeeds in creating an entertaining story. It finds the drama in reality. By showcasing the polar opposite personas of each man, we empathize with each one in different ways. In many ways, the film does what any great documentary should. Through loud grunts and a funky score, it brought bodybuilding into the mainstream, kickstarted the fitness craze of the 80s, and the career of a global superstar. It also made Lou more famous than ever. In the same year that the documentary was released, Lou Ferrigno signed a contract with CBS so that they could film him with green paint on him. But despite its success, does all of this deception make Pumping Iron a bad documentary? 
If the purpose of a documentary is to show a subject impartially, and give the audience an objective eye to look at the subject, then yes. Pumping Iron is a terrible documentary. It makes up parts of its story to enhance the drama, and may have even unintentionally changed the ending by doing just that. Which is not what an observational, fly on the wall documentary should do. But I lie to you too. Throughout this video, I repeatedly called Pumping Iron a documentary. Pumping Iron is not a documentary. It's a docudrama. A blend between reality and fiction. Of course, no documentary can be truly objective. By constructing a narrative, you have to be subjective in some ways. By choosing to film particular subjects, you leave out others. By asking certain questions in interviews, you look to elicit a particular answer. The very act of editing a movie together shapes the audience's perception of your subject. You could leave out or leave in things that may make them think or feel differently. The documentary filmmaker is engaging in a medium that cannot ever be objective. Neither should it be, because objectivity is boring. To be engaged, we have to be following a story and taking creative liberties to make the story even more engaging is the cost that Pumping Iron took that paid off in many ways. When watching a film that documents real events, it's tempting to believe that what is being displayed is real. Truth is, there are many ways a documentary manipulates the truth in pursuit of an engaging story. Just because it's labeled documentary, it doesn't mean it isn't a docudrama. But honestly, what is the value of objectivity in the face of giving the world this? It's as satisfying to me as uh, coming is, you know, as uh, having sex with a woman and coming. And so can you believe how much I am in heaven? I'm like uh, getting the feeling of coming in the gym, I'm getting the feeling of coming at home, I'm getting the feeling of coming backstage when I pump up, when I pose out in front of 5,000 people, I get the same feeling. So I'm coming day and night. I mean, it's terrific, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm in heaven.